Nice ride. Welcome. I like it. So, um, I was thinking about the dreaming scenario and being awake. And, you know, considering we've both, you've caught, you've, you've definitely got some hours on me in the sleep realm. So I was wondering what you're feeling right now in terms of, like, did you take any, like, significant dreams away from that sleep? And also, how, in terms of waking up from the dream that we're in now, you know, because it's like, we go to sleep, sometimes we can even wake up in the dream and think that, like, we woke up, but it's not qu quite lucid dreaming, but you can, like, wake up in a dream, like, think you're dreaming, but then you realize, oh, shit, I'm in oh, a yeah. dream again. So, the question is, how do we wake up from this dream you know, because we're still sleeping on the on a certain level, but anyway, well, go. I guess one way to do it is to recognize when you do things that violate the laws of science. Mm. Um, it's about the recognition. Recogn what do you call it? Re recognition. Mm. Recognition. Um, right. So it's those little glimmers of like supernatural effects that are kind of when we're waking up like when maybe when we feel more synchronicity that's like a moment of like waking up in waking life synchronicity yeah. with the energy when when like the, the yeah heart the energy and, really. and the fact that we're experiencing it like the more we experience synchronicity the more we're waking up so it almost turns into like a constant synchronicity like every single <laughs> thing we come into contact with yeah i think that's true uh, I don't really need to be on camera. I wish we are we both on camera there. Hi. Uh, so synchronicity, what synch synchro synchronic with what? Mm. Synchronic with knowing what is coming. Oh. Um, maybe because isn't it maybe when like a, a crazy synchronicity happens? <laughs> there's a. Uh, you're, we're kind of like, oh, I knew that that was, I knew that, or mm -hmm. I felt like I'd done that before, or it's like, so then it turns into the, like the constant synchronicity might be the just tapping into knowing the future already and the past and just like time in a more so, natural way. So you think being familiar with your past gives you an opportunity to be more familiar with what's coming? Yep, definitely. Like remembering, remembering everything that we can from this life, and also, you know, what remembering what our energy that like created each of us individually was doing like before we were born. You know, because it's funny you can talk about it as like lifetimes, but some people like the reincarnation idea isn't exactly their cup of tea. So, but like I feel like most people might be able to agree that you know, the energy that, like, composes their body and potentially their consciousness might have been present prior. And so, like, remembering that is, like, even the next step of just, like, you know, we have a hard enough time remembering what all events from this life. So you think, like, genealogy, like, the mm. grandparents and, and, with, and things like that, and parents, obviously? And yeah, there's definitely a... That's, like, physical remembrance, which definitely has an effect. Like, I feel like our ancestors, like, we connect our lives can connect with theirs in weird ways. Like we do similar, similar things sometimes, but like there's also the, what would you call um, genealogy of like non-physical? Yeah. Entity like, uh, meta genealogy. <laughs> yeah. Or entic, I thought E N T I C E N C E maybe. Hmm. Nice. Uh, 
maybe. What'd you call it? Macro genealogy? <laughs> Any Micro of the genealogy. prefixes. I so got, you're, oh, what were you saying? No, so you're talking about the energy, um, like, rather than like, well, okay. I know what you mean, because that was my question. Is like genealogy as important as what the energy field was up to around, I don't know, what? Uh, yeah, the... Because the gene... Well, genealogy could connect to DNA... And then DNA is obviously a multidimensional object. Like I feel like the whether DNA is physical or non-physical, it's it, like it is a part of it. So there's because there's energy present in it that is you know because like the coil. Yeah. It's like it's coiling. If it's coiling, then there's movement. So. I don't know. I mean, genetics. I like. Have you looked into your like personal gen, like DNA? That would mm. be interesting. Like, God, why don't no. we all like l- like? Why aren't we all looking at pictures of our own DNA? I don't know. <laughs> and like getting definitions for because different letters do different things. Yeah, like it would just be in. We could ma- we would have a better. In the same way that we look at like our ancestry, why wouldn't we? That would be sweet. There, it would be cool if we could access that. Like there was some place you could go and just like. Where would you even go? Like, you're, you have to get your own test. But you could, like, could you just scan your hand on something and pick up, like... I forget how much they cost. Like, I remember there was this research that people wanted to do for... Have you ever heard of the Star Child skull? There are all these different skulls that have been found that, like, some have, like, super elongated heads, like, literally, like, cone head type stuff. And, you know, some people will say that that is, like, a genetic defect some sort of like enlarged skull but there's this other camp that actually thinks that it's like a different race of humans that used to be around so this guy and then there's this other skull called the star child skull which has like these different modifications in it and so Lloyd Pye I think is his name he like has this skull he owns it but he doesn't like you know it's owning skulls whatever that means (laughs) so but he was trying a DNA test so he could prove to people that it was actually like a totally different kind of DNA that, you know, isn't from this world necessarily. I mean, I, he, he's trying to say that it's like some sort of like star visitor or something. Um, well, okay, so your DNA... It costs a lot to get. What, to get? A test. Oh, I see. Yeah. And where do you go to get it tested? You could probably look it up. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, so like your DNA in your hand, is it the same as your DNA in your liver? Yeah, I think that there, my intuition would say that the same DNA can be found in all of our cells, like in a root sense. And everyone's DNA is different? Yeah. Oh. But, yes, 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 yes. But I think that our DNA, I don't think our DNA is fixed. You know, I feel like it can mutate as we're going through life. Yeah. What I've learned is like, there's different segments in DNA. I don't know how many, like eight. If there's eight different DNAs in a in a strand, which becomes a gene, mm-hmm. there's X amount of DNAs in a strand, which uh, which is basically it's cut into segments and then it creates the, the gene. Mm-hmm. But when those change, the, the different segments of the DNA change, it changes what, what gene it is. And so, like, if it's, like, if DNA 1 is up and DNA 2, 3, and 4 are down, 5, 6, and 7 are up, Mm-hmm. then all of a sudden one goes down, it becomes a completely different entity. Right. So almost maybe if you took a DNA sample of us from one earlier point in time and one later point in time, and then, you know, maybe if you were going to, like, try to create a whole other version of you from that DNA, then they, they, might, they would be slightly different. Well, oh, yeah. 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 Interesting. So if you if you created a clone of yourself from when you were 27 as yeah. opposed to when you're 50 or whatever, 57. I've been hearing some insanity about different, like, cloning factories that exist. Like, there's this one lady coming out saying that, because in the Human Genome Project that's going on, supposedly there's some very questionable activity going on, like, in order to fulfill that project. Like, this one lady says that she was... She had something, like, grown in her leg for it that, like, they didn't tell her about. And then they told her it was, like, a tumor or something. They took it out, but supposedly it was actually, like, a life form that were growing in her. (laughs) 
I don't know. That's I'm not trying to say what is true or not, but there are definitely places that supposedly have like one percent like cow or something. It's ninety nine percent human, one percent cow, or whatever other creature. And so in that sense, the, the way they get away with it is they say that it doesn't have rights because it's not a hundred percent human. So it doesn't have like the universal human rights that most people would get. Do you have like a documentary or something? Yeah, there's definitely some good stuff. Um, the project Camelot has done. They have like they do all these documentaries, and they have one of the main that lady who came forward. But then, um, in terms of the cloning stuff, like I know that there are released documents about experiments, experiments, and you know it's like what's public is you know animals, so like totally public. That like the, that sheep or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Dolly. So it's in the, yeah, Dolly. Why? It's funny like not knowing specifics at the moment that you, like you want to have some specific hard facts, but like it just seems obvious. What that they're cloning people? Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, yeah. if they can do it with one animal, they can do it with all the animals yeah. or probably all the life forms. I would think even. What they just clone the. Ce what do they do? They just kind of put the DNA inside the cell and then let it become a, a sheep or whatever. Yeah. Um, it would, it would be weird to see. I don't know if I would want to go in there. I mean, I feel like you can alter your DNA on your own. Yeah, absolutely. So to, like, have a machine do it for you seems, like, excessive. Yeah, it's, you know, it needs to stop, honestly, because it's, it's probably really ruining our, our, the, know, the, the purity of our, you know, it's like when you clone something, when you clone a fruit or whatever, the more genetic modification that occurs, the weaker the strain becomes. So, um, it would work for all different scales. Like, if we're cloning humans, did you ever see that movie Moon? Yeah. You know, yeah. it's like they keep living for less time. That's why they have to have, like, thousands of versions of him in the basement so that it can keep happening because it gets weaker as you go. And then, you know, walking around the street, like, if so if they exist... Are they in the streets? Are they kicking it with us? Like Clones? Yeah. Yeah? Well, yeah, they are, I think. So you think it's been happening for a while and that people are out there with, like, genetic modifications yeah. from factories and stuff? Yeah. Or power plants? But not, not to, like, get into a fear mode, but just that... How annoying is that? That, you know, if we met someone who was, like... And then they try to influence our DNA, like, say it's a girl or a guy that... You know, if you're, uh, say I wanted to, like, meet this girl and, like, take her out to dinner and, like, build a relationship and all of a sudden, like, she has some genetic manipulation that it, you know, because when you have sex with people, like, that is influencing your DNA. So, you know, it's not to, t I have a feeling, unfortunately, <laughs> that there's gonna be a new form of almost racism that has to do with that idea, like people's genetics. And actually there already is, like that's obviously ancient, kind of like eugenics is what you call it, it is racism. So it's really fucked up because you, every, everybody deserves equal treatment, obviously, no matter what has happened to them. Like it's not their fault necessarily that people, they were treated that way, but. Well, my question about equal treatment is should should levels of intelligence dictate how something is treated? No. Okay. Not at all, because that's the whole, like, with plants and stuff. But then, like, if if your mom was to come into the room, or someone was to come into the room to ask you, you, you and your dog are sitting there, and your parent comes into the room, or whoever, someone comes into the room, and asks you to do something, and you question them, and say, well, why don't you ask the dog to do it? Um, would that be racism if she were to say, because you are smarter, and that's why... I want uh, something, I expect something different from you, you're going to get something different from me. Right. I don't, yeah, it's, would it help the plant? Supposedly I hear that plants like to be talked to and that they respond very excellently to human interaction. So, <laughs> you know, the extreme would be to say, Mom, what the, what the hell? Like, you're damaging this entity's evolution by not acknowledging it and at least asking it the question. Maybe it doesn't respond and I do. But at least, at least address all of us. <laughs> so you think the fair thing would be for her to ask the dog, and if the dog doesn't respond, to, to ask the next person or the next creature? 
or at least when asking us or you acknowledge the dog you know don't just acknowledge the dog's energy always acknowledge all the life life's energy that's in a space well in a situation where if you were sitting in a room with a, a clone, like a modified person that was like part cow, mm -hmm. and maybe because of the modification they were, or even you can take it so far as to say someone with like Down syndrome or some some sort of brain retardation, um, is that is it is it is it racism to treat those people different? Because people will, I mean, from what I know about people, they wouldn't elect someone that was like mentally retarded to president. Right. I don't think. And is that racism? Right, but the, and it's funny because we're talking about over-association of words you, that people have, so, you know, we think retarded or any word is inherently negative, like, is, that would, racism would be a really good question, like, is racism inherently negative? Right, and, and is it more, is it more than just the strong, the intelligent survive, and that will always be true, and the people that are intelligent would... Right, but maybe there's a chance that someone with Down syndrome could emerge that is literally knows exactly what's going on, and everyone's like, "Yes, yes, <laughs> yeah." But or aut autism, or you know, different form, like different dysfunction uh -huh. dysfunctions that you know they're the, the savants can Interesting. crunch numbers better than anybody else. So it's for everything you take away, a new shape is created. Yeah, that's why you can't count anyone out, mm -hmm. even if they're part dog. Right. So what? Huh. It's interesting. Yeah, there's definitely a war against consciousness. So that, like, yeah, I mean, should we walk down there? Yeah, let's walk. Oh, okay. I've tried. I've walked down there, but I got covered in poison oak. I'd like crawl oh, all the way down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna pause it. Wait. So what were you saying? There's a. Yes. Yeah, the. W with what we were saying, like different levels of consciousness are not treated as if they're even alive. So, but then what are we supposed to say? Like it's wrong to destroy plants in order to eat them. I think that can, well, there's eating, eating can be on all different scales, but like if we're, it depends if we're eating it, honestly. Like if we're just like destroying, I don't know. It's it's not like there's a necessary method to it, but dude, I even get guilty stepping on grass sometimes. Right. But oh. should we? I don't think we should feel guilty about it as much as do what we want to do in order to make us feel as good as possible. So if it makes us feel better to walk on stones than grass, then cool, we'll do that. But like feeling guilty is just not interesting. <laughs> worth it yeah that's true i guess so like if you make the swap okay cool so if you if you what if you what if you accidentally okay not i guess what is an accident what if you subconsciously make the choice to destroy something um because of maybe the convenience of it or just the sheer feeling of it mm -hmm. and then in the middle of the destruction while it's being destroyed, you realize consciously what you've done. Guilt is not an option, uh, but what? Take yourself, either take yourself away from it or don't, uh, but you've already catalyzed the destruction, so you can take yourself away from it and it's still gonna be destroyed. You can stay there and it'll still be destroyed. Right, like guilt doesn't help at all. I should probably have taken the key out of that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> someone sniped the gator. It's possible. There's definitely some hooligans among. Um, all right, so right, it's like no no reason to be guilty, but that doesn't mean don't take away the information from the experience in order to change behavior. Like, still change behavior, but don't feel guilty, like, because that then you're just, like, ruining the experience. So, what about apologizing? Yeah, apologizing is, is sometimes important, but I don't think the actual, you know, saying I'm sorry 
I think we need to get over like saying I'm sorry, like that specific phrase. But as long as we're expressing our gratitude or you know apology in a way energetically, then that's enough. Okay. So supporting something's regrowth is better than saying I'm sorry sometimes. Yeah. All the time? Um, All and none are usually too extreme. I guess saying sorry could be a regrowth somehow. Sorry is not bad, but it's completely dependent on the intention of when it was used. So that makes sense. So if you if you say it just because that's the word you learned is what makes people get over stuff, then it's not the right thing. But right. If you're feeling it, and that's the word that comes out. What would, what would you be feeling? Regeneration. Yeah, yeah. Excerptation. It is just an easy word that we can. Do you want to go to the top of the cliff or below? I don't know. At the top, can you see the water? The, no, we I, the place where we were supposed to see the water was back at that where we were, but it was it's a little hazy. I guess let's go to the top, man. Um, I was thinking about this idea of when we say um, that it's it might be an unconscious fu- function that where we actually want to say ohm. Did you see that post? No, I just that makes total sense. I felt I could feel where you were heading as soon as yeah. you brought it up. Uh, and even any any filler that we use, it's a it's more of a vibrational reaction that we're having. Like we want to produce vibration in the conversation, so therefore we try to fill space, even though it's not always necessary. So I agree with that. There's because hmm, um, and mm, all things that people do. Mm, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm, that, that vibration. Uh, what about ah? Uh, another one. Uh, uh, yeah. That's an old tennis court up there, like 80 years ago or something, because this was all a someone's like property. A moss? Yes. A moss is right. Now it's a state park. That's a moss. Some sweet stones. So is moss always this green or does it change? This is definitely particularly green. It almost feels jungle-like. But it glows at night. <laughs> what, what glows other than, like, in... On Earth, you know, underground there's, like... Or underwater there's bioluminescence and stuff. But... So we got, like, fireflies. Do, what are some, do you know any other things that glow on the ground? Um, I think certain flowers do, but I can't mm. think of anything offhand. Right. Uh, or maybe even certain just like particulates like floating around would just have some sort of yeah I don't know. certain stones I think yeah stones like uh, I don't know if lime limestone does or absolutely not. actually yeah that's limestone does so stuff that's green the, the most of the spectrum can probably come through depending on what is, I mean, at, I'm trying to think, if you're looking at a crystal at night, or a rock, the, the light that we would see would be a result of light hitting it, rather than light coming from within it, you know? Yeah. So there's bioluminescence and just luminescence. Mm-hmm. Um... Interesting. Like, is there a... I guess that is what some people might say determines if... Look, yeah, check out this little frog. Hey, buddy. Missed him. Frog. <laughs> little mini guy. He's on the leaf, I think. Hey, man. Good to oh, see he's, you. On the, he's on the leaf. Where? Oh yeah, parallax. When you, for for smaller creatures, if you stay lower to the ground when you get close, it's easier for them to see you. Like if you're standing tall and you move towards them, you get bigger faster. If you're coming down and in. Yeah. So From one side direction. Side. Yeah. Yeah. 
That must have rocked his world what just happened. <laughs> Aliens. He's like, I've never experienced this exact experience. <laughs> There's a river down there which might have been... Oh, nice. We could head down there. It's kind of hard to get down from... Uh, not impossible. Okay. Hmm. That whole... I was listening to one idea yesterday about like when we're... Rogan was talking about, like, if you were flying above Earth and you were looking at all the different growths on it that would symbolize some sort of bacteria or, like, you know, viral growth on it, that what... It's just funny to think that, like, in, in the woods, like, there's growth that people would consider, like good life and then people would be like oh this other is like a disease like a disease that, like that hits a tree or something right you know so it's like even in a totally natural environment the uh there can still be what would be considered like an illness so that's just because of the it's basically that's just a human thing assumption mm -hmm. that it's it's bad for humans because it is something that can match our rate of production. Mm -hmm. like infestation, like mice. If you have a bunch of field mice, locusts, like uh, mold. Some people think, some people are anti-moss, right? Some people really <laughs> say, like... Yeah, exactly. That's the, that's, the, that's the crux. People are anti. It's like, if we're anti anything, we're not understanding it. Interesting. Well, that's true. I mean, to, to live in a, a spore field might not be... You don't have to be anti-spore field to not live in a spore field. <laughs> right. Okay. But to hate the spore field, to, to want to, to burn to the ground, if you burn to the ground for the right reason, is that different than hating or being anti? Yeah, I think that the... Yeah, that is different. That's taking it to another level that assumes... You're assuming power over that whole population. So, in, like, the whole greater... I don't think the greater good argument... That's... I mean, that's the biggest thing. That, that's, that's a huge, huge question. Like, if we destroy... Do we have the right to destroy vast amounts of life in order to protect it? To protect human life? Or any. Or we're trying to, like, you know, people will... Foresters will, like, go through and, like, pull out all kinds of invasive species from a forest in order to like make the other stuff survive better huh so yeah if you if you destroy something for the right purpose you balance it out right which is kind of freaky because do people do that to themselves to other other humans mm hmm yeah they definitely do and the but do you think the human eugenics or you know weeding out humans in order you know people will say that we're overpopulated so we have to depopulate and that's why who cares if these people die because it's you know we need to we need to have less people to survive there's only so many resources there's that's like the scarcity mindset which isn't even true so like do you think there's a difference between like d is a human actually some sort of like more divine manifestation not more divine but more something you want to that, that deserves more attention than killing a tree I think so because if we could build laser guns with our and we're small and frail our bodies relative to like a tree's husk but our minds make us build laser guns and flamethrowers that can destroy anything around us like with the click of a button and it's like mm -hmm. any any one of us can do it so I think maybe not more divine maybe more powerful but even then not necessarily because our bodies are so frail that's what got me on that topic uh, well, humans are always maybe going to treat their own species with more reverence, mm -hmm. maybe. I think people are, I mean, 
yeah. deep down, we're protectors, right? Like, we want mm-hmm. to help everything around us. And yeah. we get angry and frustrated and then break stuff because, I don't know, because they're having a hard time doing it or something. Yeah, because we, I th- we're starting to see the benefit for even us individually of everyone surviving. And the fact that we can, that everyone surviving would potentially increase our whole life for all of us. So not to make it like an ego thing, <laughs> like, oh, I want to support everyone else so I survive, but like that is how it is. Like oh, yeah, when yeah, everyone sure. else is better off, we're all better off, so. But it's weird because like, just like um, anything, it's if, if you have too much of one thing, it destroys the ecosystem. So too many people would... Unless we're super smart and we can, we can stop destroying the rest of the ecosystem, mm-hmm. spread out, like literally stop chopping down trees, stop killing plants, stop mm-hmm. killing animals. It's like, but basically use stem cell meat to root to, instead of human, you know, use stem cells to produce the vegetables and fruits and meat. Is that as nutritious? Is that as good for us to eat? Um, if you put the same minerals in it that are in the ground, if you can somehow measure it and, and reproduce it, it would be like eating a digital... It'd be like listening to an MP3 copy of an MP3. Right. So, so pretty much the same. Maybe over time, though, over millions of years, you would see a degradation because people aren't getting the, the nutrients of the planet. Um, but at the same time, when they come back to the planet in millions of years and they eat it again, it'll get, it'll take them above where they would have been if they'd been eating it the whole... Unless we can somehow balance out the amount that we eat and take. Yeah. I think that there is... A, I mean, with the suppressed energy technologies... Like, in terms of there being too many people, like, stopping people from wanting to spread their DNA, their consciousness, I feel like that is just a, that's a horrible thing to do to somebody. It really, to really make them feel like they shouldn't spread themselves. You know, like, they need to not do that (laughs) because they're hurting other people by doing it. But in the the reason that so many, like, environmentalists who are well-intentioned people will say that, um, you know, we have to stop having kids and blah, 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 is because they don't understand the fact that there is technology that exists that could be, like, literally all the food, organic food for everybody. No fossil fuels to make it, no CO2, no, you know, well, CO2 is inherent element Mm -hmm. or compound, but... You can feed the plants with it, though. Yeah. You can use algae to create energy... Mm-hmm. By feeding it CO two and sunlight, right. This is what oxygen. Yeah, there's just an agenda. There's a eugenics agenda, because ultimately, I think they there's too many people for them to control. The people want to control us, which is why they they don't want to help the the people really controlling all the deaths occurring on the planet. I think that they want less people because then there are less people to take power away from them. I don't think it's because they like want to save the world and like. <laughs> You know, it's definitely not that, because you can't contaminate whole landscapes with uranium and, you know, killing people without consequences. Like, it's not helping. Okay. So, the people... So, you think there are people that are suppressing energy? Like, literally... I mean, so you're saying, like, J.P. Morgan? Yeah. Is that the guy? Was it J.P. himself, or was it his grandson? So, it was JP himself. So he bought up the patents for Tesla's. Oh, he was working with Tesla, and he took Tesla's funding and basically so gave him a bad name. Who's alive that's done that? Well, there's definitely. I mean, like the Andre Rossi cold fusion thing that we were looking at, and then like John Searle, that generator. Like there is stuff. Like all that needs is a few million bucks to become an industrial operation. But the problem is, there's just. There aren't too many pe- There aren't enough people yet. There's starting to be, but like investors who see how that could change everything and like are willing to put it down. Like most of the wealth, wealthy people in the world are tied up in those big oil, fossil fuel, nuclear energy interests. Huh. I wonder if any of the people that run oil companies use like super low-cost electric power to heat their homes. Right, or even their own factories. Like, how funny would that be if they use, like, sustainable technologies, like, in order to, like, get the oil or something, just because, like, they knew that the, that the interest was there. They own the patents to whoever, and they, yeah. they, I mean, I would. Yeah. Probably, unless you make blatantly more money from taking your own oil, but I don't think burning your own oil would, because you 
it's just surplus is worth money in the long run. You mm-hmm. have to use as little of it, your product as possible. Yeah. Yeah, dude. That's awesome. <laughs> I want there, there's a lot of Tesla's paper like they have a lot of his notes that some of his papers have been released and the, it's just the, the, the if you go to uh, like the Orion project dot org or something they have a whole list of like the thousands of patents that are proven to be classified like 100 percent there's a whole list of free energy patents that with magnetic engines and all this kind of stuff that and they say that they're not going to release it because of a national security interest. Because, you know, if the regular citizen got a hold of one of these things, then they could make a whole power plant. And that's not okay. That's, you know, that's the kind of thing they would say. Or they could make a weapon with it. That's like... <laughs> that's crazy. Yeah, it's... So we have to get past the life of fear. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's where they're taking it. Like, how do you get past something like that? Just wait till all those fearful people die and stop, like, don't be fearful in your life. So when you're 80. Yeah, that and try to get one of the patents out. Oh, that's easy enough. (laughs) Yeah. There's probably patents that haven't been bought up and made private yet. Oh, definitely. I mean, the funny thing about Rossi's, they got a patent in Italy for the cold fusion, the ECAT energy catalyzer which blends nickel powder and hydrogen and, like, some other catalyst and gets, like, 800% over unity. So you can, even when you don't have any energy going into it, like, on the test that they just did on October 6th, for, like, multiple hours, they three hours, they had wa- a huge thing of water boiling, complete, boiling perpetually for three hours, and there was no input going into it. So in the U.S. wouldn't give him a patent. But Italy did. So that's the kind of like big shit that can change the game. If the U.S. gave him a patent? Well, that, yeah. That first, but he... The fact that Italy did is great. I mean, he got the patent. So... Awesome. Yeah. I really like that magnetic engine. Yeah, that one. Totally. Which one's that? That's called the SEG, the Searle Effects Generator. That's one, and then... There's a, there's a whole bunch. If you go to freeenergynews.com, there's a really good... It's like a wiki site for free energy. And you go through it, and it's just, it just makes you <laughs> a bit disturbed, but hopeful. Awesome. Yeah. What is it? It's just, it just shows you all the different free energy types. Freeenergynews.org? Yeah. Dot, dot org or dot com? Dot com. God, and then awesome. it's also Pest Wiki. PESWiki.com, Pure Energy Systems, and this guy Sterling Allen, he's a he's a great free energy researcher, and then like he'll be the like he's one of the main people who covers the Tesla Tech conference, which happens every year, and that's where you get all these people bringing little devices. Nice. There's, there's one. Uh, have you seen the like a donut shape? Supposedly is. Like, that's how energy system, many energy systems are. I think, like, around us, we have a donut of energy, like, coming through, like, up mm-hmm. this chakra and, like, around in the same... The Earth's magnetic field. The Earth's kind of. magnetic, magnetic field, yeah. So, there's this one coil called the Rodin coil, where it's a, it's or it's a torus. Yeah. So, um, and they wrap... Torus. They wrap wire around it and get these over-unity effects. Like, you'll... You'll put a marble, kind of, that can't make it through the center of the hole onto it when it's hooked up and has all the wrap around it, and you put it in, and it's like, try and pull it through, you know, because the, the, the magnetic force. And oh, you yeah. can get it to start, like, spinning in the cup of the torus, you know, how there's kind of like a little area... So you get it, like, starting to spin, and then that's just, like, the whole thing's moving around, and it's just, like, jolting, but it's generating energy, and it's just, like, sitting there. That's awesome. Yeah. So is, you get more energy from it when it when it spins or when it's pulling against the, not colloid, the, the tor- toroid? Is that what it's called? Yeah. It's, yeah. Um, I'm honestly not an expert on... I, it's on like... Well, not that it matters. Right, right. But. Either one is effective. But probably, I would think the spinning, 
if just a light motion past something would, would create it like a spark of energy or something, that would cause more of a current because it can move so fast. Yep. And then there's, I'm trying to think, like the water car, you know, that's, a, that's an obvious one. Stanley Meyer, early 80s, was, drove a water car across the country, and then he was killed. It's and, awful. You know, so. What happened to his stuff? People are, you can convert your car to, to have a, it's called like an HHO converter. I don't know, what's that compound, HHO? Something. Probably just water, H2O. Yeah. Yeah, but, but it's, why would they refer it? Or is it a, like a hydrogen hydroxide or something, which would be two different molecules? Right. I think that it would it would be, if it was H2O, they would say H2O. They, it's referred to as HHO. So it's, is it two molecules and they convert into what? Or it's will like, water mix it into it, H and HO? All I can do is describe kind of what it looks like. There's a, some, like a tube that, you, that extracts this almost like vapor plasma from the water and you so you can see that like steaming out of the the cell do you know a website for her yeah if you just look up stanley meyer and hho so h h i don't know if hho is free, hydroxide or what it is free energy news I, has a lot on oh nice but you can buy those like and it gets your gas car like 25 percent like better efficiency oh you install it near your engine and mm-hmm. oh that's awesome mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, it's you know, it's not about trying to get freedom out of everything. It's just about making it easier, I think. You know, yeah. it's and then in the mean while as we're making it easier, someone's gonna develop freedom. Like Yeah, freedom. You know, like where you can go from zero to infinite anytime, anywhere, and it won't be about what you have, it'll be about or it won't I mean it'll be what see, But see it's funny, like th- that's a funny phrase, zero to infinite, as if infinite is a point. Which it isn't. So, like, zero to infinite is almost zero, just zero and up. Yeah, on right. or off. Yeah, yeah. Right, because on is infinite. <laughs> <laughs> or if it, or maybe it can never turn off. But there was this weird idea floating around. Uh, I forget. I forget who was just talking about. But oh, at Occupy Wall Street, this guy interviewed me and this one other person and asked us, you know, about, like, the f- what role freedom plays in this whole space and, like, if people want freedom or if, like, they're more socialist or whatever. And it's funny that freedom actually, in its pure sense, is not possible. Yeah. Not that that's a negative thing, but it just means that there's always obviously going to be different forces that we're interacting with that are going to be even if it's just like stuff right in front of us now like that is helping dictate our movements so (laughs) in that sense it's like being like i mean fighting like freedom like that's crucial but at the same time if we can't be delusional then we're actually going to get it right improve you know getting more here is i think a big problem is when we give people the ability to buy land because you know, people can always lock their doors and then you can't free, freely walk into their house. But when people start blocking you from their land, it's very strange to not be able to go certain places. Like, right. I don't know. I mean, it's been since the beginning because someone would just walk into their camp and take too much food and go to the other camp. Mm-hmm. They, they, not even with malicious intent, but just take too much. Right. And the camp's like, what happened? And they're like, he came back for the third time and took more than we we have and they're like okay we got to tell him and then he, he do, and then you get the guy that won't stop and he comes back again and they're like listen don't do it again and then like what do you do the people are starving you have to either erect a wall or destroy the person that's i guess somewhat cancerous on the society right or and there's also a difference between freedom you know if you have your own house that you want to lock that's different than not being able to travel into a certain country, you know, which, where there might be some sort of, like, common land where people can congregate. Like, we're not even at that level. So, it's weird how people interpret socialists as having, wanting less freedom, you know, because you have to pay so many taxes to the state and all this other stuff, but at the same time, a lot of socialists are pro-immigration. And, like, free immigration and free travel, that's, like, that's a pretty huge freedom idea. But then you get all these, like, 
most of these people are people who like like to label themselves one one side or the other. But like Republicans and uh, you know libertarians will say, you know, I'm pro freedom. Yet at the same time, a lot of them think that we need to not let people travel. So it's like there's different aspects of freedom in socialism and capitalism, which is why both are crucial to embrace. Like, you know. Gosh, like one person's freedom is another person's prison. Mm -hmm. So when you when you say you, that you don't like the idea of people being told they're not allowed to spread out, that like who who decides who gets to spread out how much? Is it basically that's what money is? Is it just of like hey, if you're smart enough to figure it out, then you can. But because I really feel like if you're born a pop, pauper, you can become super rich if you are smart enough. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's the desire to become rich or, or something, but I, I really think it's just an intelligence quotient. Like if you, and it's an application of intelligence too. And I don't know why some people do apply it and some people don't, but real intelligence is the people that have it and apply it. It's known that they're intelligent. It's always in retrospect whether or not someone's intelligent because if someone does a stupid thing, they're thought of as stupid. Right. <laughs> You know, yeah, and, and the one thing, one stupid thing that they do in their life is the one thing that the media catches, yeah. and then all of a sudden they're known as, like, the stupid person. Right, and they have, like, all A's all through high school, and they're, like, right. you know, have a thriving business. But, but maybe they are partially stupid because they weren't able to make that their biggest achievement, anything else their biggest achievement. True. That's why it's always, in <laughs> retrospect, is the people that don't fuck up that are thought of as, like, successful. Yeah. Uh, it's a game of golf. You know, you can only screw yourself up. Yeah. Kind of, kind of. Obviously, there's walls and barriers, but you just gotta navigate around them. I mean, mm -hmm. people program too, so there you got we got that going. I mean, not everyone's born programmed to succeed. Maybe, maybe, maybe they are. And succeed is t entirely relative. It's so, you know, having a lot of material freedom might be the opposite of freedom to somebody else. So it's really just like, as long we just have to be open to different people to pursue their idea of freedom as long as everyone is able to pursue their idea of freedom and the private property thing is the thing that really that really makes it tricky because everybody wants more private property and if there's private property I feel like you could if you were really smart and you didn't you know you wanted to have a lot of land or in, a, in houses or whatever then that could still be possible in, if you didn't own it. You could control it without owning it in a respectful way if you were smart enough. So there could be no private property. Just because there's no private property in the world doesn't mean that there aren't going to be communities right. and all this other thing. It just means that the people who control the communities really have to be you know, communicative enough and, like, listen to their communities enough for those communities to allow them to... I guess no one would really control any community in that way, but there will always be people with responsibility for communities that's more than others' responsibilities. I don't know, that might have just been a half statement. Well, I mean, responsibility is, is chosen by the individual to take on the responsibility. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I'm always thinking like, what if two people want the same responsibility? Is it just, do they share it then? Or if one of it's a very specific thing, like they both want to get the mail in the morning, they do it every other day. But if they both want to get the mail every day, then that's, that means that there's a problem with that person and that they should be doing it every other day. Or right. if it's so important that they, they, it's like they're, since they were born, all they wanted is every day to get the mail. And there's right. two people with that same feeling. Right. How do you decide? Yeah, I mean, I feel like if they can't figure out that discrepancy on their own, then they have problems. Because there are ways that both of them can experience the feeling of going to get the mail each day. I guess they could both go to get the mail. They could both go to get the mail. They could both take half the mail when they go there. They could order twice as much mail to come. That's just specifically to them. I mean, how's, how's one person going to argue that I have to take in your mail with your name on it? You know, it would, that would be a very tough argument to win. Like, I have to take in the whole family's mail. That's <laughs> Like, it's difficult. I don't think... There's not a lot of stuff that's unshareable. 
I feel like pretty much anything that someone acquires could be shared in some on some level, even like a, an M&M. And, you know, if you really want to share the M&M, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, so what, what you said about freedom, like the key to freedom is really just being open to other people reaching their own freedom rather than, because I feel like I have this calling or desire or something to like go change other people's system to give them more freedom. Right. And I, that may be working against the idea of freedom because I'm... No, I think the National Initiative is... <laughs> that is... How, how, well, so how would you say that would be encroaching on people's freedom? Just that I'm in people's faces, taking up their time. Right, right. Mm, yeah, in some way that is... But it's always their, partially their decision to be in your face at all. If they're there and they're listening to you, they're listening to you. That's true. So, if yeah. If they stop, they stop. Yeah. Okay. And if I keep pushing it, then that's a problem. So right. If someone doesn't want to listen, they don't listen. Totally. So, yeah, I think that anyone who argues the National Initiative for Democracy, making it direct, that's yeah, that's absurd. So some, some things, though, I, I, you and I agree that I think the National Initiative is, is worth arguing and, and getting people's face about, but, like, some things people want to think that may, might bring about more freedom for everyone, I think maybe won't, like like closing the borders of the United States or something. They think this will be more freedom for everyone in the United States and therefore everyone in the world, or whatever their, their logic is. Uh, so it's almost irrelevant what the thing is, but if someone, it's like if, if, they try and, if they try and change other people's ability to get freedom, is that a prop? I mean, obviously, that's what we do as humans. We're always interacting with... And, and some people are more, too much focused on other people's freedom. Mm -hmm. So I guess... I guess there, I have a self-benefit from passing something like a national initiative. Totally. Yeah, fighting for the freedom of other people in a... It, because a right-winger who is pro you know, fences at the borders. There's no way that they could potentially, that they could ever argue with you that, that that is for freedom. I mean, maybe more freedom in their own country, but they would have to admit that there are elements of that idea of putting a barbed wire between countries that is, is, is infringing upon freedom. So both it's it's always both it seems like, yeah. back in the day people would build walls around their city and i think you know as the evolution called for it that was an awesome idea because mm -hmm. not only would they have wild animals come breaking through the fences and shit every once in a while but you get like barbarians and crap just like st stupid people it's tough to, i don't like to say stupid and smart because it's all so relative really but like just people that were aggressive and would come take things from the city without like this, whatever they call it, civilized, you know, these right. people that are trying to trade things without hurting each other, mm -hmm. trying to make sure everyone gets enough, and then someone comes in and just, so they put up huge walls, and now it's like these people are afraid that Mexicans are going to come and take a bunch of stuff like they're savage or something. Right. Barbaric. Or, and it's like, dude, don't you see that in 2011 that no one's, not no one, I mean, obviously, you might have fucking gangs come across the border with AKs but I doubt it because you got the American military gonna wipe out any any incursion right you know? as long as you have regular law enforcement patrolling every part of the earth in a equal way then it's no safer or less safe I th it, it might be legitimate uh, just as a stepping stone to, for us to say okay everyone can travel anywhere but to get a job somewhere or to get, like, a residence somewhere, maybe that, you know, just as, so that we could still all travel. And then when we're all allowed to travel, maybe we can't get a, you know, full-time job. Like, we can, it, it makes us all more travelers at heart, you know, and we're kind of all, you know, taking home with us and working wherever we go. So, because it is true how, like, economies get disturbed by 
by those effects, but it, it's obviously our the national international economic structure is not right. suitable. It's not the right structure. Yeah. That's why it gets disturbed by travelers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right. Like you should be able to go buy a house somewhere else. You just be able to walk up there and buy a house and live there. Yeah. You have the money. That's the same fucking. If you have the wherewithal or the equipment to do it, I don't like the idea that you have to go run it by someone. But I mean, I guess. They've, they've figured out over the years that you have to go run it by someone or you're going to have someone build a house in your backyard or whatever. It so, so, seems so far off, but I really think we can build boats in the sky. like Oh, totally. With like uh, aerogel and, you know, you can vacuum it out. So it's basically like air, boats in the water, how this air keeps them floating, the mm-hmm. air in the hull of the boat. So you build something like that that you vacuum out so there's no air in it so it floats on the air. Right. And then we could have like levitated structures and stuff. Uh, yeah, but if we could build above each other, it would it would. But then you think about buildings and stuff and the danger, of, you know, mm-hmm. of, of tall buildings. It's not really dangerous. They're they're useful. Yeah the the method to how we build our houses. I mean, in terms of the exchange thing that you were saying, like, I don't know. The, what people object to world government about and what they object to free travel and all those other things is that who's going to control it? Who is the government? Who are, are these, like, you know, trilateral commissions, Council on Foreign Relations, like, war mongers, NATO? Is the, are these the people who control the world government? Like, hope no, they better not be. So, but that's who wants to do it right now. And that's, like, what the European Union and all these different you know, consolidating economic structures are trying to do is create a global currency, a global government. They want to, they, they actually want us to do that, but the problem is they're, they're abusing us and they're taking advantage of, uh, of our energy. And so it almost has to be a decentralized, like, self-governance. That's what that whole thing in Ungrip, that film we were watching, talks about is conscious self-governance so it would be like world government where everyone's free but it's really that we are self-governing we it has to be there can't be a centralized world government because i mean there could be but it would have to work together as an equal with all the people and all the different entities and that's like the i mean i don't i even if we tried to make a self-government like a, a uh, oh shoot! How much time do we have left? Let's back up now. I don't know how much time is on here. So, how do you save the world? What does that uh, mean? I would say be conscious, just like pursue consciousness, and. I, I honestly do like self-governance. I think that like that phrase is really hits the nail on the head because relying on it's not that it's wrong to rely on other people, but when everybody is totally able to sustain themselves and contribute back, like that is like the broad I think this is it. Like that that could be like the broad system. You know, because we're listening to Bucky Fuller talk about, like, design systems. So, like, that's, like, a large-scale model. When everybody can do that and everybody feels like they benefit from that, like, that would really help. Rather than, like, all these little solutions, like, you know, a bunch of windmills or, you know, solar panels. Obviously, that's all important, but, like... When people try to say that I'm going to save the world with one thing, like, we have to be pretty specific that that thing has to be a systemic, like, design oh. change. What do you and think? I, I think that's true. What do you think is the most liberally conscious or something way to alter someone's basically their DNA patterns so that, or their way of thinking so that they become self-reliant. Uh, what does that mean? Into a sense where, like the question I have is like, okay, assume you, maybe you do or don't have a car. You decide to become totally self-reliant. You stop signing over your, your corporate name to the, the U.S. government. Mm-hmm. And 
you, you maybe you do you don't have a car. But what if someone does that and they want to still have a car and they want to drive on the roads outside of their house? Do they should they pay taxes to the gov the U.S. government for their roads or for I, the roads that? I wouldn't have a problem. To, you know, for people who dr drive, because we were talking about this a little earlier, I remember. Uh, you know, if you're a driver, then it makes sense that if if you have if you participate in that, then you should have to contribute to the funding for the maintenance of the roads of the system that you drive in. So maybe there would be a way if you only wanted to drive in your town then you would only have to pay a little bit but if you you know you would kind of sign up for it like you would like you would anything else and you would contribute it to it as if it was a I don't want to say like private contractor but like a public contractor more so you know if then so you, if you if you wanted to be a world driver drive around everywhere in the world and not get pulled over for you know, driving, like, because you wouldn't want people who only drive in their town to have to pay for roads in across the world if they never go there, you know? But if you, but that should, that would, that should, if they don't want to pay for roads in China, then they shouldn't have the right to drive on China roads, theoretically, maybe. So you think, like, when you sign up for your, well, would you, if you were self-governing, would you get a driver's license? Oh, well, I wasn't really talking from the perspective of a self-governing well, system. If a self, someone decided they wanted to self-govern and they stopped signing their name over to the, to the, just to the corporate idea of whatever the U.S. does, mm -hmm. um, could they get a driver's license or would that just be signing their corporate name over? Um... Like, the only reason, thing is then if you do drive on the American roads, they're going to want to see some ID, some American ID, because it, they've deemed it a privilege of uh, the state to drive, basically. Right. You know, I'm going to retract kind of all that blabbering that I was just doing and say that I like the idea that if you drive and the road is too messed up for you to get through, then it's your responsibility to get through or get around it somehow. And if somebody's going to go out of their way and make it fix that block in the road so that more people can, you know, get around it, then that's a great thing that they did that for everybody else. But I don't think that it is your responsibility to do it for anybody else other than yourself. I mean, it doesn't mean that I, there's a common misconception that if all we care about self-governance, if all we care about is self-governance, then we don't care about others' governance. <laughs> but we do, because self is others. Like, the self, when we take care of the self, we are taking care of everybody else. So, if, you know, we're living completely off the grid, which is actually on the grid in reality, you're, like, tapping into the grid in a, in a better way when you're off the grid the real energy grid of the planet, then that is having a benefit to everybody else because it is, you know, starting an energy field or and also stopping to tap into all the corrupt energy sources. So, I mean, the, the IDs and stuff, I think that it's good to represent yourself to people and, like, but... So maybe if you do become a self-governor, you can create your own ID. Yes. And then you can you can be like, as long as you're not driving on their roads. That's the thing. If you drive on someone's roads, you have to have a license with that country. No, but you can have an American driver's license drive on Canadian roads, right? Yep. Is that just because of a treaty between the United States and the Canadian government or the Canadian corporation? Yeah, right. So, yeah. Um, so if you have an American driver's license, can you drive on German roads? Yeah, oh. I think you can. Chinese roads? I think so. Okay, good. 
Yeah, that's, that's you might have positive. to get a Chinese one after like you live there for a week. I know when you go to a state, sometimes they give you like literally two weeks to get a driver's license or something for that right. state, technically. Mm-hmm. And if it's a different country, they might be like, if you're just passing through, it's one thing. But if you've been living there, it kind of reminds me of there's this one case, and I forget if it was like Belgium or Sweden, Sweden or something. But there was this one intersection in a, in a road that was totally crazy just heavy traffic a lot of accidents a lot and it was all it was working off these light you know traffic lights slave to the traffic light and what they did is they took away all the lights they took they took away everything they took away all the signs and everything and just to see what would happen and it is there it, it runs so much more smoothly everybody it's all just the cycle of who gets there you know you take the order of your turn depending on where you got there and it, it it's improved. To it's a circle. Degree. It's like a rotunda with like a cross section. Dude, know, that's with awesome. Two different roads coming into is, it. Is there a and website with it? Yeah, if you, I'll definitely post it to this. Sweet. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I probably. I think I feel like it's gonna rain. HD flip. Flip it. Right, I'm gonna record the drive back. Cool. Choke. Choke. We are certainly not respecting the ants right now. Sorry, ants. Have a nice day. That's hilarious. Because in, if one way, if you look at it, sometimes I think people's definition of being conscious also kind of coalesces with what we used to be before we started developing intelligence. It's just like stable and existent with everything. But then at the same time, ants would crawl in our ears and eat our brains and shit. So we developed all these procedures to... And that's kind of what's made us conscious is, is knowing that if you sit in a cesspool, you'll get sick, maybe. Um, not necessarily, but start deciding, oh, you can wipe that stuff off and they're not going to get as, you know, then they can lick the surface and they won't get sick. All right. I would say, should I close this? I uh, know. Um, consciousness, I think being destructive is part of being conscious because forest fires happen if you don't clean out and get rid of the brush that they drop off and burn it and destroy it then they're more likely to become fully destroyed. So you destroy a small part of something and then the fuller growth is allowed to exist. So like sometimes step it on ants, I guess, because they'll, they're, they'll, they'll come into your house and take over your food source if they can. Right. So. Right. So, yeah, no, I definitely do not want to give the idea that I was at all. I tried to say like it's not good or bad. Like destruction and creation are total parts of the duality, which is part, which is crucial like that's what I, re- I watched this one great video talking about you know some people will try to demonize duality as if it's some kind of negative thing but it's really a, it is our experience and so we can't say that it is there's something wrong with it so I just think with destruction like people will just take advantage of that and as long as we're not, I mean but then taking advantage like that is such a funny phrase because you can take, it literally means its own opposite. Because you could take advantage of someone and just totally rip them off. Or you could take advantage of someone and like totally be harnessing their energy. You're taking advantage of their energy. You know, so it could mean this horrible thing where you like rip them off. Or it could mean this thing where you harness them. So it basically means taking advantage is taking more of it than the average. Mm-hmm. So, so with destruction, 
do you think like just only like a small percent of what we are should it should be destruction? Yeah. Like a, like a one percent or even way less than that. Like. Yeah. Numbers. As I don't. Yeah. Maybe I don't even know if numbers matter. Just as long as we are connecting with what we know. I mean, whatever we do is what we do, and that's what we have to do, and that's what we should do. But or but should is a tricky word that. You know, it's not, I'm not going to over, over-associate, but to say that anything should be a certain way, it's hard to say. But the destruction, I mean, we have to destroy conscious destruction. That's all that I can really say. Oh, yeah. As long as we know that we know what we're doing. As long as we are aware of as much of the destruction and feeling that destruction... As possible. So, for instance, like if you kill a chipmunk, then and you acknowledge it and you respect that death that occurred, and you do what you have to do, then that's conscious destruction as opposed to wiping out a whole farm, you know, f- you know, family of chipmunks by running them over with your like steamroller. You know, it's like. Without even knowing that you ran him over. Just because you were riding a steamroller, hmm. you ran him over, and you didn't even know that you did it. That's interesting. So so conscious destruction sometimes can be morally better than subconscious destruction. Mm. And it, interesting. Conscious destruction is the way to destroy. If, right. Or destruct, if anything. Construct, destruct. It doesn't have to be a, right. a guilty blow, like a, a blowing up of something. It does, you can dis- take things apart deconstruct them without destroying them. Right, so the method. Destruct. <clears throat> Destruction, destroyer. To D-E-S, it's that word again. D-E-S, like desire, design, destroy. Oh, right. D. D is the prefix, which means like uh, out or like away from. Like to uh, deploy. You know, so I think that's... At, but the S, I don't know where the Because the S is there too. So D-E, like in Spanish, it struct. means of, I think. S- D-E? No, oh, D-E-E, no, D-E-E, day. Of, yeah, of. Right. Of, I think, of that. Yeah. So, away, D-E is, a, is from, like, mm. to or from. Fro. Des, D-E-S. But I it's, it's what... weird to think, like, all right, so if, if you learn that a whole army is, or, you know, this little militia is going to attack a whole town and kill the whole town, and you know that they're going to do it, well, that's issue number one has already arisen. Do when you do some sort of pre-crime um, enforcement, stopping them of doing it, are are you making a mistake there in in saying that you know they were gonna kill all these people, so you killed them first? So that's the first issue. But then it is if you how if you're if if you I'm killing people is kind of a tough tough one to work with, but I guess we will. Um, If you're dropping bombs on a village, then how are you going to... It's almost impossible to connect with all the death that you're causing. Like, in this way, if you run over Chipmunk, you can go up to it, acknowledge it, put it in the ground so it's not in the road, you know, just getting, like, embarrassed. But we can't possibly connect with all the individual lives that we killed when we drop a bomb on the so is it possible to consciously destruct a whole village or a whole militia that's trying to kill a village if we can't consciously connect with all those entities like mind you know? control um it's like how we are completely ignoring what we're killing when we drop a bomb on a whole town. I've never done, I've never killed anyone for the record, but um, it's it, so the utilitarian thing, like doing the best thing for the most people, like in warfare, that's what the excuse is. We're doing this in defense, we have to defend these things. Like, that is, it doesn't make sense because you can't account for that much loss of life. You can't think about it. You can't. <laughs> conceive of of all of the of all of that intelligence well <sighs> maybe you can maybe maybe yeah see I, and, and this is the thing like almost every conversation 
I, I've been starting to notice just goes in this kind of direction, which is fun. It's like a, it's like bouncing a ball or something. Mm. You know, like we'll, we'll say like one idea, and if we haven't maintained balance and like full consciousness in that conversation, like we just did, we'll say, oh, maybe actually wait, it could work. It could work this other way if you somehow really did put out some sort of energetic output that really was a conscious decision to kill 10 people in order to save a thousand people. Uh, I mean, well, it's like if that's, but this thing is, there's really no way to know. I mean, if you have like hundred percent undenying evidence that in 30 seconds, 10 people are about to go into that building with guns, no matter what you do, unless you, unless you disarm them and lock them up. I mean, that's right. the ideal. Yeah. That's the idea. Or even just convince them not to. If that's the case, or trick them, well, you know, you could always use bad things, but what grabbing them might even be considered bad. I mean, absolutely, I man. It's yeah. See, I my inherent wrong in that was that I was assuming that you had that. I don't actually think that, but I fell into the trap of saying, "Oh, the only way to stop those people from killing them are to kill them," because it, the smartest way to destruct that little cluster of, you know terror would be to de deconstruct it in the sense that you can you show all of them the better alternative to to not doing that which may be tying their shoes you know it might be so simple trick that can cause them a better thing to do <laughs> right in those seconds um one one another another metaphor <clears throat> i have for the same the same kind of thing is one time a long time ago um uh my brother came back my younger my young one of my well my brother came back he was younger um crying from the park and these kids had been like really mean to like kicking sand at him or something and I was just like infuriated and I never really got in anyone's face I was like kind of pushed around as a young kid so I, I, I was like I went to the park and I was like listen you motherfuckers who, who kicked it at Michael I was brother mm -hmm. like, it wasn't me I was like yeah well it was one of you guys or all of you guys who did it and you know, they were like scared shitless and I was like if you ever do it again I'm coming for you like don't fuck with me and they were like and they never fucked with them again. Right. And I, so in that thing, it, I, don't, I think it was worth it because it was, it was a conscious thing. I and mean, you said I'm coming for you rather than saying I'm going to fucking kill you. I wasn't gonna which kill is what people will fall into saying. They'll say I'm going to kill you if you do that. Yeah. But rather than saying I'm going to get gonna you. Honestly, scare I'm, them. Right. You scare them still. But at least let them know that there are repercussions for stuff like that. Right. But at the same time, know that not, you know, everyone can make a mistake. I'm not going to go punch these kids out. I wanted to let them know that if they continue it, it would, it would, it would be their downfall. Mm -hmm. And if you can somehow let aggressors know that by showing them the better way to go of working together, how, how their lives can actually be better if they throw their, down their guns, you know, throw, mm -hmm. um, or do whatever, turn their guns into fucking backhoes or whatever they need to be. I mean, nothing wrong. I, I don't hate guns, but what else are they for other than hunting? And Well, you keep, keep... See, it's like every time I start to think about the better world that's coming, I start to think about the people that are farmers that get barbarians on come onto their land, that get aggressed on. It's like, what do you do if dudes with technology you've never seen appear? You use your best defense. I mean, what... Mm -hmm. Not that... I mean... You don't have to try to kill someone with a gun either. I mean, obviously, you're always going to be deconstructing them in some way when you shoot them, but I'm not... I think that it, saying that no guns... any It's like that anti thing we were talking about. How can you... You can't be anti any piece of technology necessarily because you could use a gun as a paperweight. You could use a gun to shoot down a branch from a tree. I mean, it's, it, true. it's like... To use as a fucking log to get across a chasm... You know, to save your life. Right. Our problem is that we perceive gun we do the over association with guns is that we think that they're for killing people or for killing things. Interesting. We, so they aren't necessarily for killing things. So you think conscious projectile behavior is more difficult than what would you call upfront close behavior? Like Conscious projectile. What do you mean? Like to be able to consciously understand what's happening over there. As oh right. As what's happening right here? Both. I mean, yeah. Like knowing, like when 
are you bringing back to, you know, knowing, understanding the consciousness of what we're destroying? Exactly. Or changing. Right. Like right. To, to drop a bomb on something is, is more difficult to know what happened down there unless you can, than, than what's happening in the room. Mm-hmm. Right, so tech... Is that a problem? That, maybe that technology needs to be increased so that we... But then that's kind of like a little too, like, peering into what's happening 60 miles away is kind of like, do they know you're peering in? Do they want Yeah, to but, I mean, we kind of know that the streaming and surveillance world is we're always streaming and if we if we don't live like we're streaming all the time live and recording that's going into some database that could be accessed later on i feel like if we don't live like we're on camera all the time then we're not going to behave the way that we want to behave because when we're on camera we really want to share and be like what we're really experiencing and like what we really feel as opposed to what we, you know, some, you know, voice in our head <laughs> telling us what we want. Like, we're not, some people will be vain on camera, some people will, you know, fall into traps on camera, but once you really stay on camera for a while, I think that we want to express our truth. Yeah, it's the best, I mean, it's way, people know when it's not real. It, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they can rewind it and watch how not real it is over and over and over, it's like, you got, if you're not real, that's what I learned about acting when I was studying the theater and shit. Is mm-hmm. that when you the camera notices every lie, every little inconsistency, like the stage. You know, you can be talking like this, and if it seems real, and if you follow through to the end, then it's real. But when you're on a camera, if it's not real, it's so obvious. You know, right? And heightened reality is is existent on camera. A lot of my friend, like Lisa, like a lot of, you don't even bring it up, but like a lot of like the, the goofy skits and stuff that we've done are like hyper reality. And it's still kind of believable. It's even more believable than regular reality if you can't hear it with the microphone. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and there are ways, just because we're speaking in, you know, not our native accent, then it, it doesn't mean that we're not able to find the same language in present in <laughs> whatever we're trying to do. You know? <laughs> and so we, if, if we're skilled enough, we can... <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. Skill? Yeah. If you can, like, trick people into thinking what you're doing is real, or do you trick yourself into believing it? Well, acting, isn't that, like, the nature of what acting is? Is to become a different reality? Yeah. Or to ex- act... Is act... Acting isn't necessarily fake. Because all we can do is act. If we're expressing ourselves, we are acting. It's an action upon what we're, our energy. It's, it's, it's an action of our consciousness. So being honest and being real are two different things. Right. You can really be fake. You can be really fake. You can really... Yeah. Can be, fakeness can be reality. Or, or, dis- or But honesty can also be reality. So you can, honest reality is the best thing like what we what we naturally tend towards when we know everyone's mm-hmm. watching even if we're lying in order to express that honest reality you know like show like it would be hard to act in a way that is the opposite well we actually know we role play all the time like basically you know like you motherfucker i'm gonna fucking like kill you you know like that is the hate, the fear, like, I'm gonna... <laughs> so, but, so you think, but, because I've noticed with saying stuff, like, if you lie to, to create, like, a, an honest reality with a lie, like, it becomes your reality. And, like, if you say... You're gonna, yeah. You're, like, you're, like, pulled towards it in your thoughts, and, like, you'll have voices that tell you to do what you said you were gonna do. Right. Even if you didn't mean it. Yep. If you didn't intend it. I was programmed to say, I def- or at least partially programmed, to my expression of, you know, what is hate and what is a lie is for me to say like mother fucking kill I'm like I'm gonna kill you like those are phrases that like I have been I've heard so many times and like even though the, like ultimately in my heart I would say there's a better expression of what I would want to present as the furthest thing from what I want you know I wouldn't I don't even like really like saying the phrase motherfucker I really don't but it's so, it just, it said so much, it's just influenced all of us to a certain degree that, but like, 
you know, we, we want to be happy about the language that we're using. Yeah. So, so actually, I'm gl- well, I was acting there. So it wasn't what I, w- I try not to say it. But then just joking around, I'll say it sometimes. And You know, that's the thing. Yeah. Like reality, like it, joking around is fun. <laughs> like playing D&D. I, I playing like this fucking rogue that killed a bunch of people and still will and like is kind of a good person but he's kind of kind of off you know fucking do what he's got to do he's got a dagger and he'll use it like if he needs to he'd rather disappear and get the fuck out but and uh, playing video games you know you play you, you role play these characters that are like sometimes demonic or like have these strange inhumane destructive powers and forces or wills or and you can play them good or evil but like that stuff fucks with my reality because then I come back to try and be honest and it's like, yeah, motherfucker. Like, yeah, yeah. you know, not not good to say stuff like that, I don't think. It's kind of aggressive <laughs> or mean. Right. Um, and it's putting out that actual configuration of vibrational frequency, which in the word fuck, there, you know, obviously it can be perceived in any way. You could, com- you could s- show some tribe Uncontact, uncontacted tribe you can present the word fuck to them and tell them that it means love and then they would put the intention into that word that would have a positive vibrational effect but I do think that, that some words were engineered originally to have this pure and harmonic emission that really does help us so that's kind of what that whole like Sanskrit, Arabic, Hebrew thing they were talking about in Chimatica was about, like, those languages were engineered by, like, more pure roots. I don't know that for a fact, but who knows? Yeah, man, I think a lot of our roots. That's why when well, I'll hear a word that, like, is Greek, and I don't even think about all the languages that appeared between the Greek translation and the modern-day English translation. I just like to listen to all the direct relations between the Greek and the modern-day English, and, like... It's all, yeah, it went through, like, three transitions of language to get here, but, like, it's still, we're almost saying the same thing sometimes, like, Mm -hmm. and the word will go from, like, one thing to another thing to another thing to another thing to this, and then this is more like it than any of those three somehow, in some way. Right. We can't say that later incarnations of the language are necessarily worse. Or less accurate. Or 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 less less accurate. Right. Because it's, right, right. Because how could any sound possibly be more destructive than another sound? I don't know. It's totally, it's totally about how you relate it, I think. You're right. Because if you go, if someone's saying, kuh, 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 is like a good thing, then that's how, that's how their whole culture will be. Like, yeah. Uh, and then other people might think, kuh, kuh, like, do- if you go to a dog, kuh, 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 it might like step back. Right, but the, like, it's it's the intention in the noise, like, because the energy you put just put down by that, like, like, rather than, uh, so you, think you know, some things, some words are easier to put gentle connotations with. Than other ones. Well, they are easier for us because we've heard them used in certain ways so many times. But you know, the whole, I. The whole, like, do we, are we controlling our language? And, I mean, if we definitely have to, we don't have to. <laughs> we, I've been loving using the phrase might. Like, you know, we might think about, so, because then we're not saying, like, this is the truth. But it's, like, it, it's, it's a nice, like, predecessor to a statement that I've noticed that, like, res- responds well with a lot of people. Like, including myself. Like, we might consider that, (laughs) yeah, man, and that there is that, like, source current of energy that is dictating or helping co-create our decisions, but there's obviously also all this programming, but, like, it's not... Everyone wants, or not everyone, most people want to think that programming is coming from the either coming from the outside or coming from the inside. So it's like, how do how do you think we can make get that awareness out there that we really have to stop saying one way or the other because this is like that 
design issue. Like, yeah, self-governance, but self-governance doesn't mean that you only care about yourself. Like, self... We need to change the definition of self, maybe, to encompass others. Like, in the dictionary, it should say self. An, indiv an individual entity. Whether a human, a planet, a cell, a galaxy, you know, like that... <laughs> An individual entity or all individuals within the entity. Yes. Yeah, actually, I didn't even bring in the many. Yeah. One, yeah. So, okay. That, I, and I, the I, collection I, of many, you know, or, yeah, one entity or the multiple entities that make that one or something like that. Oh, yeah. Because every cell in your body could be part of yourself mm -hmm. and you are also yourself right so maybe we can work on the wiki page oh, yeah. <laughs> let's go to the the self yes. and see if there's trolls who uh self help trolls who say no 